My name is Dr. Dan Lesham, and I'm the director of this center, Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives. For those of you who are here for the first time, uh, welcome. Please take a chance to look around. Um, to make room for this event, our permanent exhibit is um, set on the side, but come back another time and see it, and we're gonna have a new uh, rotating exhibit in going up this week. By the end of ne by next week, it should be up on Hollywood and the Holocaust. So please stop by next week and um, join us uh, for the new exhibit. We'll have an official launch event um, in a couple weeks. Please, before you leave, grab one of these catalogs. It's our series of events, and in here you'll find the opening of the exhibit on March 6th. So that'll help you figure out what you want to attend in the future. And we also have a smaller brochure that hopefully you have all seen that details all the events in this series, which is this year's uh, KHRCA colloquium series. Um, the focus is on gender, mass violence, and genocide. If any of you had the chance to join us for the first four events last semester, you've seen what a remarkable and compelling uh, topic we have and how interesting our speakers have been, and please join us for the remaining uh, lectures as well. So this colloquium series is, um, is in part thanks to the support we received from the National Endowment for Humanities, who was looking for a way to help community colleges like ours use the resources that they already had in cultural centers on campus, like art galleries, like museums, and like Holocaust and genocide centers like the one you're in right now. We were able to get a very large matching grant from them where we raised money and they gave us money. And the idea is that every year, starting four years ago, and will continue for as, forever into the future, we're gonna have a series of lectures on a topic related to Holocaust, genocides, or human rights that'll be led by a faculty member from this campus and will be targeted towards the students of this campus and really will be focused on introducing these deep, substantive, complex humanities questions into courses all across the humanities. So it's not just in a class on genocide that you'll hear about genocide, um, but that you can, in your sociology or in your econ class, get examples of real world, deep, complex, and challenging issues that come out of the work we do here at the center. I think this kind of work is crucial. The kind of education you're here to get is not just the, the memo memor memorialization of dates and facts, and it's not just the special knowledge you'll need in your careers in the future. Our hope is that you'll also gain a critical sense for interpreting the world around you and the world to come and becoming agents in affecting change and in helping shape the world that we will all come to inhabit very soon. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to this year's faculty coordinator, um, Dr. Amy Traver. everyone. It's nice to be with all of you. Thanks for being here. After a series of cold days, I'm happy to be inside with all of you. Um, okay, so we're commencing the second semester of the 2015-2016 Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives Colloquia Series, as Dan said. Uh, the title of this year's series is Gender, Mass Violence, and Genocide. As a reminder, this series draws together expert scholars, students, faculty, and staff in the study of gender's influences on experiences of mass violence and genocide. So during the fall semester of this academic year, we learned a great deal about what, what uh, Dr. von joden forge calls life force atrocities, the uniquely gendered forms of violence that women and girls experience in the process of genocide. As we analyzed the civil war in Bosnia and the Nazi Holocaust, we came to understand that these atrocities often include, but are not limited to, sexual and reproductive violence, as well as the forcible separation of families. Our four spring events will continue this comparative and in-depth study, offering additional insights on gender, mass violence, and genocide. And today's event is a great example of the intellectual work that we have left to do. Oftentimes, our efforts to understand how gender shapes human social life focus solely on the experiences of women and girls. The reason for this are obvious. 
Given the extent to, women, to which women and girls' experiences have been ignored and suppressed throughout history, they are certainly due our attention. But what happens when we fail to consider men's experiences in society? When we neglect to examine the ideology of masculinity that is so central to our collective organization of the world? And what might this oversight mean for our efforts to predict, to prevent, and to reconcile mass violence and genocide? So today's speaker, Dr. Adam Jones, will help us begin to understand the role masculinity plays in mass violence and genocide. To do so, he'll introduce us to the concept of gendercide, or gender-selective mass killings, which have historically targeted non-combatant men. Dr. Jones is professor of political science at the University of British Columbia in Canada. He's the author of Gender Inclusive, Essays on Violence, Men, and Feminist International Relations, as well as a dozen other books. He was recently cited as one of 50 key thinkers on the Holocaust and genocide, and he has worked as an expert consultant with the United Nations Office of the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. Dr. Jones is also the co-founder and executive director of Genderside Watch, a web-based educational initiative that confronts gender-selective atrocities against men and women worldwide. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jones to QCC. Thank you very much. Let me begin by thanking um, Amy and Dan and everyone at the Kupferberg Center for this uh, invitation. It's a great pleasure to come uh, back to Queens and to look around at this audience and see such wonderful diversity in the faces. We were talking just before this talk about um, a recent book called Pax Ethnica that looks at uh, certain territories, municipalities around the world that have done uh, extraordinary things in encouraging and accepting diversity. And there's a chapter in that book about the Queen's experience. In many ways, what I'm seeing in front of me right now is an important aspect of the project of genocide prevention. That is to say, encouraging diversity, encouraging inclusivity. And in uh, presenting to you today on the theme of gender, I also want to promote a kind of inclusive approach to the subject. Um, as Amy was hinting in her introduction, I have done a lot of specific work on the issue of men and masculinities in the context of genocide, but it became clear to me fairly early on that if I wanted to say something um, valid on that theme, it needed to be a framing that was indeed uh, inclusive of the experiences of girls and women, and particularly of the um, frameworks and guidance that we've received now from generations of uh, feminist critics and scholars on these subjects. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along. Let me just begin by defining a couple of terms because Unfortunately, when one gives a talk on gender and genocide, one is dealing with two, as we call them, essentially contested concepts. Um, relatively few people will agree on the parameters of either of them, and those of you that might be familiar with my introductory textbook on genocide will know that chapter one contains no less than about four pages of alternative definitions of the word genocide that have been put forward over the years. Um, when we look at the concept of gender, most scholarship and commentary draws a distinction between what we might call um, physiological or chromosomal sex on the one hand, and gender which is presented basically as the forms of cultural conditioning uh, that determine values and identities of femininity and masculinity. My own use of the term is a little bit different and follows Joshua Goldstein's quote here. You can refer to his book for sort of um, exploration of this argument. But he sees physical sex and uh, cultural gender as being mutually constitutive. He's skeptical about uh, easy binary distinctions between the two. And therefore, he, as I, 
um, uses the word gender uh, to refer to masculine and feminine roles and bodies alike in all their aspects, um, biological and cultural. To give you an idea of how this works in practice, when I talk about something like the gendering of a mass grave, I'm referring at once to the sexed bodies that are in that mass grave, and I'm also referring to the cultural patterns and expectations of gender that put those bodies there or contributed ideologically to very often gender disproportionate outcomes or sex disproportionate outcomes, if you prefer, in these graves. So just keep that in mind um, as we move along. When we talk about genocide, of course, we have the United Nations Convention on Genocide, which um, has established a kind of consensus in the sense that nobody's really very happy with it. Um, and most uh, scholars in the field of comparative genocide studies, which I'll talk about uh, in a second, have preferred to adapt or develop their own framing of genocide. Particularly, you may recall, the United Nations Genocide Convention protects only four categories of human groups. Those groups are national, ethnic, racial, and religious. And leaving aside the fact that since the convention was drafted in 1948, we're now much more skeptical about terms like race, which seemed very much to be essentialized to the drafters of the convention. So there's problems with the uh, genocide convention's categories, but also with the fact that it is limited to those four groups. Some of you will know that there was extensive debate during the drafting process about including political groups. They were eventually left out. Uh, many other scholars have argued for the inclusion of social classes. Um, a, a classic example of that might be the kulaks, the so-called kulaks under Stalinist collectivization in the Soviet Union during the 1920s and 1930s. Um, a scholar named S.P. Uh, Ayadu Kumar has developed a concept called poor side meaning basically the targeted intentional destruction of the poor. These are social classes. But something that is increasingly well recognized, I think, among genocide scholars and reflects the fact that um, we now have several generations of um, predominantly feminist commentary on gender issues is a recognition that the Genocide Convention does not protect gender groups as such. Uh, and that could be not only biologically defined women and men, but gender groups in the sense of, for example, LGBTI individuals and so on. I'll come back to that briefly later. So one of the reasons that I took in adapted form Stephen Katz's um, definition um, from his uh, book, The Holocaust in Historical Context, is that I like very much um, the fact that he uh, enumerates a range of additional groups that should be included in this category, including gender groups. He makes the important point, uh, which I don't really have time to get into in detail, but I think is intellectually quite uh, fascinating that these are groups as they are defined by the perpetrator. Um, just to use the example of the Jewish Holocaust, for example, what determined whether or not you were murdered as a Jew by the Nazi regime was not whether you claimed that identity for yourself. Indeed, many of the German Jews who were genocided considered themselves to be assimilated or secular or even to have converted to Christianity. Rather, the Nazis had a particular biological definition of Judaism uh, based on lineage, and that was applied to you. You were a Jew regardless of whether you claimed that identity or not. And um, another interesting example perhaps is uh, the European witch hunts, for example. You know, were those victims uh, standing up and saying, yes, I belong to the Society of Witches? No. Um, and indeed, there were no people flying around on broomsticks at the time. This was a figment of imagination, and, but it was nonetheless 
um, the kind of identity that was imposed upon the victims. So, um, and by whatever means at the end of Katz's definition there, I think is also important and pertains to the question of structural and institutional forms of violence, which I think are very much uh, standardly left out of the portrait of genocide. We tend to think of genocide as an event. No, uh, we might differ as to whether the Jewish Holocaust began in 1933 or 1938 or 1941, but we feel that it has a beginning and an end. Um, attention to structural and institutional forms of inflicting mass mortality allows us to recognize that genocide can also be a process and that it can in fact be a very deeply embedded process extending back millennia. And I think that that framework is particularly important in, in uh, understanding the gendered vulnerabilities of women and girls. Um, who may receive a certain exemption for reasons I'll discuss, may, I stress, receive a certain exemption from physically exterminatory actions during genocide, and yet nonetheless may be vulnerable to structural and institutional forms of violence that can exact a death toll many times greater than even some of the most severe genocides on the human record. So that's basically the um, project that I've put forward. Let me give you a little bit of a sense of where I'm coming from here and how not only I got into the field of comparative genocide studies, but how my interest in gender issues was in fact um, the spur to explore what was at the time a very new field. Um, I, was, I did my master's degree on a totally unrelated subject at McGill University in Montreal in 1989, and I was in Montreal on a date that will probably not resonate with anyone in this audience, but which is very much inscribed in the collective memory of Canadians, December 6th, 1989, when the largest mass murder in Canadian history took place at the Ecole Polytechnique institution in, Mex in um, Montreal. Uh, at a time when I was a couple of miles, living a couple of miles down the road, um, a crazed and vengeful young man walked into the college with a gun, um, systematically separated female students from male students, shouted out at the women, you're all a bunch of feminists, and gunned down 14 of them. Um, it still stands as the largest massacre in Canadian history. We are, unlike the United States, we don't have one of these every week. Um, it was an enormously impactful time to be in that city. I was one of about a million Quebecers who filed past the coffins of the victims at the National Cathedral. And it got me thinking along a number of lines one of them being um, the continuing power of misogyny in our culture and the way that it can have um, detrimental and destructive uh, impacts upon women and girls. Um, there was one comment that surfaced in the aftermath of the massacre, and it was made by one of the young men who, uh, who was separated from the women. Um, and he told the newspaper, I assumed he was going for the men. When the women were separated from the men, he assumed that the killer wanted to target the men. I had already by that point achieved something of a uh, familiarity with a wide range of global conflicts, and it did strike me that to the extent that I was familiar with such processes of gender separation, for the purposes of murder and um, genocidal destruction, it seemed to me actually that the vast majority of cases would have reflected the reaction of that young man that one would have expected, that it would be the men that would be murdered, not that the women would simply be sent to a safe place. Indeed, a whole range of gendered atrocities, particularly sexual assault and sexual enslavement, 
would tend to be imposed upon the surviving population. But the physically exterminatory dimension was overwhelmingly directed to men. I asked myself, has anybody ever looked at that? And it still seems to me the case, and it still seems to me very surprising that until I published an article called Gender and Gendercide and Genocide in the year 2000, it seems that nobody had ever taken a kind of systematic and global historical look at that phenomenon. I wanted to explore that. I wanted to advocate around it. And this, I think, is one of the things that drew me into this remarkably interdisciplinary field of comparative genocide studies to which I now belong, um, was a sense that you were not only engaging in you know, an intellectual exercise, oh, isn't genocide interesting, et cetera, but you were drawn to that subject because you wanted to stage some kind of an intervention. And in my very, I'll never forget, um, a comment made to me by a fellow attendee at a conference in Switzerland in the early 2000s when I was just beginning to present on the broad theme that I'm addressing here today as well. And it was a bit of a tense time to be presenting some of these arguments. I think the debate has evolved substantially since that time. So I was a little nervous and hesitant, and I think she saw that. And she was an African woman delegate to the conference, and after I'd talked and she was on her way out of the room, she passed behind me, just patted me on the shoulder, said, good for you, men need advocates, she said. And it struck with me and has stayed with me ever since because it really in some ways flies in the face of some stereotypical understandings of men and masculinity, doesn't it? That they are the power wielders, that they are the perpetrators of violence, um, that they have a degree of invulnerability and impunity um, that is not extended to females and so on. Um, I wanted to get beyond those stereotypes, but as I said, I wanted to do that in an inclusive way. I wanted to do it in a way that, among other things, recognized that um, the limiting of genocide to the category of political and military events was not going to take us very far, and moreover, that if one wanted to do justice to the generations of feminist thinking around these issues, one really needed to explore structural and institutional forms of violence reflecting patriarchal ideologies in society. And in terms of situating myself then, particularly vis-a-vis -vis feminist critiques, I wanted to make sure that this didn't become just another kind of reactionary anti-feminist discourse saying, yeah, what about this? Or, you know, you're always playing the victim, the kind of stuff you hear from the men's rights movement and so on. <laughs> um, in 1999 came another watershed. That was the year of the interventions or the, the genocidal or proto-genocidal outbreaks in Kosovo and East Timor. I, by that point, had done some early work on the former Yugoslavia, and in 1994, I published an article you can find on my website called Gender and Ethnic Conflict in Ex-Yugoslavia, where I argued, among other things, that if we were going to have a really inclusive gender framework, we needed to be looking at um, a wide range of gender-specific atrocities against women and men both. And this was very evident throughout the 1990s in the Balkans War, you, uh, Balkans Wars. You're probably familiar with the Srebrenica massacre of 1995 when 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men and boys were systematically separated from the remainder of the um, internally displaced population and massacred by various means and at various sites in the vicinity. Um, and as those sort of reports started coming out again from the battlefields in Kosovo and after that in East Timor, particularly in the case of Kosovo, I remember reading the news reports and going, gender side. 
I've always had a kind of, I'm, I'm English by origin, so I like to play with words, right? We're sort of uh, born punsters, I suppose. And I briefly pause to congratulate myself for having in, made such a notable new contribution to the language. Unfortunately, even back then, we had search engines, and I plugged the term in and found that someone had gotten there first. And the person who got there first in 1985 was Marianne Warren in a book called Gender Side, The Implications of Sex Selection. She coined the word, um, but as you can see from this crucial paragraph from her sort of framing theoretical chapter, she rejected terms like genocide and femicide, uh, the latter of which is still quite widely used, because they were not sufficiently gender inclusive. Gendercide is a sex neutral term, she writes, in that the victims may be either male or female, and from the advocacy perspective, there is a need for such a sex neutral term. Notice, notice incidentally how she also goes back and forth between gender and sex without uh, and kind of collapsing the two. Um, since sexually discriminatory killing is just as wrong when the victims happen to be male. Uh, she then goes on from there to spend the rest of the book talking about female specific issues. But it nonetheless gave me something, a kind of peg to hang this framework on, um, the combination of an inclusive language and the sense that a uh, project of moral advocacy around um, gender and humanitarianism as it related to genocide also needed to be attentive to um, the masculine men and boys side of the coin. Um, let me try to indicate some of the ways now where the introduction by myself and others of a gender framing in comparative genocide studies um, has led us. What, how does it help us to understand um, ideological aspects of genocide, but particularly the kind of empirical dynamics and processes and stages that we very often see in genocidal outbreaks? Genocide scholars are especially attentive to the kind of data that can help us develop more sensitive tools of recognizing potential genocidal outbreaks and potentially intervening in them before they reach the level of full-scale outbreaks of um, mass violence. And I've argued in chapter one of the same textbook that one of the useful aspects of gender, and I, let me just clarify that I am not presenting to you and have never presented gender as some kind of magic key to understanding genocide or stopping it. It is one variable among others. I'm gonna talk in a second about how it combines with other variables in, in rather complex ways. I personally think it is one of the more interesting and significant variables that helps us to understand this phenomenon and to develop interventionist strategies against it. And I have argued that the vast majority and perhaps the totality of genocides throughout history and around the world today can be defined um, as one of two types. Either they are gendercidal, which means um, physically uh, destroying selectively members of one gender group, or they are what is often called root and branch genocide. Have any of you heard that phrase before? Uh, basically implying the total destruction of all sectors of a group. Um, Think about the term for a second, root and branch. Where does that metaphor arise from? What's the root? What's the branch? OK. Uh, did you say eugenics? Yeah. yeah, OK. I think you're very much on the right track. I think it is a reproductive metaphor. I think it is suggesting that you are ripping out, essentially, the organism of that targeted community at its reproductive roots. And I think implicitly understood here is that the root 
is the female that gives birth to the branch, which is the child. I think what is going on here is that there is implicitly a sense that in root and branch that is totalizing genocides, children and women are being drawn into the target category. Implicitly, then, there is a separate category where they are not or where they are being exempted to a significant degree from the physically exterminatory dimension. Usually, I stress, uh, as a prelude to inflicting other forms of gendered abuse and atrocity upon them uh, that do not descend to the level of total extermination. And I should clarify that my own understanding of genocide, like Stephen Katz's, does focus very much on the physical killing dimension. I do feel that that has to be there in a systematic and fairly large-scale way in order for it to meet the framing of genocide that I use. Um, when we talk about gender side versus root and branch genocide, we can talk about it as two different types of genocide, but we can also talk about it as a phase model by which I mean that virtually all root and branch genocides will begin as gendercidal ones against the adult male component of the community. Um, to see that operating, there's no need to look further than perhaps the three canonical genocides of the 20th century, the ones that have received the greatest attention and study. In chronological order, the Armenian Genocide of 1915 to 1917, the Jewish Holocaust, which I personally date as 1941 to 45, and the Rwandan Genocide of 1994, April to July 94. In all three of those cases, one sees a progression from the selective targeting of the adult male and, and specifically younger adult male, sometimes what is called battle age male component of the society. And that gives you a clue as to why this is being done. One might ask whether it also gives us a clue as to some of the different origins of this kind of uh, atrocity against men versus women. That is to say, if you are a genocidaire, a genocidal perpetrator, and I do hope you will never become one, um, you have a project to complete which involves conquering, neutralizing, destroying, transferring, whatever it is, a, pop a population. Um, logically, and genocide is standardly a very logical policy. We want to think of it as some kind of irrational outburst of hatred. And it is far from that. I mean, it includes a great deal of ideological hatred, but it is also a rational and often very successful from the perspective of the perpetrators, policy to follow. And if you wish to impose your suzerainty over uh, a targeted group, you stereotypically understand the adult male component to be the group that is best able to resist your designs. And therefore, even if your goal is to exterminate every last member of that population, first you want to remove those who are most deemed able to um, resist your further designs. So it may also be the case, and frequently is the case, that such discriminatory killing of the younger, predominantly younger adult male population of the society is necessary and sufficient as far as the physically exterminatory dimension of the genocide, uh, the genocidal project is concerned. Um, and therefore, what I've tried to um, present here is some examples from roughly the last 100 years of cases where we see the physical killing bounded by this kind of gendercidal strategy. So these can be considered gendercides as opposed to root and branch genocides, but also the way that such gendercides often serve as a kind of harbinger or tripwire 
for extensions of the genocidal strategy to the remaining surviving members of the population, children, women, the elderly, the disabled, everyone. Now, the classic example of that, the canonical example, is the Jewish Holocaust. That is probably the case of genocide that most people think of. How do we see these strands playing out in the case of the Holocaust? Um, many people date the onset of the Holocaust to Kristallnacht in 1938, the night, the night of broken glass in Germany, in the aftermath of which 30,000 Jews were rounded up and sent to um, Buchenwald and Sachsenhausen and Dachau and other concentration camps where they were severely brutalized, hundreds were killed. Um, and the remainder were freed only um, under coercion that they would immediately uh, emigrate from Germany. Every last Jew arrested in that roundup was male. And one of the arguments that I'll make at the conclusion today is that that kind of generalized mass roundup, detention, persecution of the male section of the population is one of the most reliable indicators that we have. Uh, one of the most brilliant canaries in the coal mine, if you like, that lets us know that something large scale and exterminatory may be in the offing. And we should be, if we are indeed interested, in stopping these processes before they reach that stage, we should be very attentive to those kind of dynamics. Um, 1941, the Nazis invade the Soviet Union with the Einsatzgruppen battalions, the death squad battalions following behind the regular army, cooperating with the regular army to round up and murder uh, Jews en masse. Um, Look at how that project develops, and you will see that in a very short period of time, we're only really talking about six, eight, maximum 12 weeks of the summer of 1941. You begin with mass executions of overwhelmingly Jewish men. And just a few weeks later, you are seeing now the dynamic of root and branch genocide, where whole families, whole communities of Jews are being rounded up in the kind of scenes that probably are best um, uh, symbolized by the massacre at Babi Yar in uh, Kiev in, uh, 1940, in late 1941. Um, one can argue that the use of the gendercidal strategy against Jewish men was a form of blooding and acclimatizing the perpetrators to their genocidal tasks. Because Jewish men were understood prima facie by the Nazis to be dangerous, and I will show you shortly some of the imagery, propaganda imagery, that was designed to create that sense of the satanic, not just the satanic Jew, the satanic male Jew. Um, the population had been primed to view that as the enemy. Um, and had they just been let loose on the entire population at the time, you would likely have seen what you in fact did see when the killers are set loose against children, women, the elderly, the disabled, all of the groups that are stereotypically constructed in patriarchal society as helpless, weak, defenseless, and so on, um, the perpetrators start to break down psychologically. They start to exhibit a lot of anomic behavior. They start to seek to avoid killing duties. They start to drink themselves senseless at night. And that is the reason for the development of the gas chambers. To take the killing away from those up close mass executions by rifle fire, which were producing psychological breakdowns among some of the killers, being forced to kill groups that they had grown up believing were defenseless and helpless and should be protected, um, and to take them into a more uh, physically secluded, sanitized kind of environment where you have one technical specialist looking through a peephole to see that everyone in the gas chamber is dead. Um, you are, it's be, been long understood that that was a way of sparing the perpetrators the kind of psychological stress uh, that up close and personal killing with 
blood and brains splashing all over you as you're doing it. It's rarely understood the gender dimension. Now, here's something interesting about the Holocaust as well. By the end of the exterminatory program in 1943-44, even the Nazis have come to the realization that maybe it would be better to enslave these people and get some value out of them as opposed to simply murdering them out front. What happens then? Men, surviving men, among the Jewish population become selected for slave labor because the stereotypical understanding is that men are more capable of hard labor. And women, certainly women who are pregnant or with children at the selections on the platforms uh, in Auschwitz and other places are sent directly to the gas chambers. And so by the end of the genocidal process, you are actually beginning to see a gendercidal dynamic that is disproportionately targeting Jewish women. That is very, very rare in the history of genocide. Um, and it is, uh, in the sense of actually selecting between the two groups. Shaka Zulu in the mid-19th century in southern Africa is about the only other case I've ever read. He was a despot who thought that he could basically incorporate outgroup men into his army, but children, women, the elderly didn't have any military functions, so they could just be killed. And there's a logic to that, notice, okay? Um, but it's a logic that's extremely rare in the history of genocide. I think that's kind of intriguing and, and worth exploring. Now, I've mentioned that there are other variables involved. I've contended that no genocide has ever targeted a given human community on the basis of a single identity, a single variable alone. Let's again use the Jewish Holocaust as a test case of that, because I think if there is a collective sense that a particular group was once targeted on ethno-religious grounds for total destruction, that is it, okay? Well, I've already suggested and indicated that there was a notable gender variable operating in that policy as well, and that indeed the image of the Jewish enemy that the Nazis are setting up in their propaganda is very much gendered male slash masculine. Um, Jeffrey Herf, in a very good book called The Jewish Enemy, has argued that in fact the Nazis constructed the Jews primarily as a political enemy rather than a racial one. And that it was the co construction of this notion of Judeo-Bolshevik, the notion that Jews were in league with Stalin and communism and, and incidentally in league with FDR and Churchill and capitalism, you know, pulling all the strings behind the scenes. But that construction of Judeo-Bolshevik, you're starting to see a political variable coming in. You could argue in some of the propaganda that there's also a dimension of social class. Certainly the Jewish enemy is depicted as a plutocratic figure, uh, the person who is commanding the world economy, the, the elite of the elites, right? So there is an economic slash or socioeconomic variable operating. And without all of those variables coming together, you don't get the particular outcome of the Holocaust. And I think you can look at virtually every other genocide and see a wide range of other variables operating. And it's one of the reasons that makes it difficult to say that a genocide is being directed against a particular group because of its race, ethnicity, na nationality, and so on. Um, the variables can also operate as a phase model. And what I've tried to suggest with this very simple diagram, which is the only kind I'm capable of, <laughs> of constructing, is that you see a progression from a general targeting of a broadly constructed group according to nationality, ethnicity, race group, racial, religious, I've added political, social class, this, the categories that are usually recognized as being the targets of genocide. Then, once that decision has been taken to 
um, destroy or neutralize that group, certainly weaken it to a point of uh, posing no threat to the perpetrator's designs, there will be further breakdowns, and I stress this is for the physically exterminatory aspect of the genocide, by gender and secondly by age. One might also say physical ability versus disability might factor in there as well, that men, for example, who are disabled might be seen as less of a threat and might be granted an exemption. Um, so the variables come in, can come into play at different times, at different stages of the genocidal enterprise. And again, I think this helps us understand something of a stage model and perhaps develop useful strategies. Now, I've been speaking so far about genocides as traditionally understood as political slash military events with clearly defined beginnings and ends. The first challenge to that in the genocide studies framework was um, scholars of indigenous peoples around the world. Um, Ward Churchill, the controversial scholar, has a book called A Little Matter of Genocide about the North American indigenous experience. And the subtitle is Holocaust, and oh my goodness, Holocaust. Uh, the point is from 1492 to the present, okay? He's arguing that this is a process of genocide that has been going on for hundreds of years. And those who look particularly at the fates of indigenous people around the world are much less likely to adopt this kind of event-based structure and to recognize that these can be very long-term processes that in fact can still be continuing in particular forms today. Um, so that's one framing that gets us beyond this rather limited understanding of what is genocide. Another one I would argue is attention to forms of structural and institutional violence. And I argue this not only because I've long been interested in the concept of structural violence, but from an advocacy perspective, if your primary concern is to help alleviate the suffering of the maximum number of people, certainly not to arbitrarily exclude huge numbers of people. How can you ignore the kind of structural and institutional phenomena that in fact give rise to death tolls that can be many, many times greater than the political military events that we standardly refer to as genocide. How many infant girls throughout history have been victims of female infanticide? Um, it's not purely on the basis of their gender. We could get into that some other times. Obviously, age is a factor here as well. Um, but it clearly represents a patriarchal animus against femaleness that is entrenched in virtually every human society going back to the dawn of history and probably beyond. Um, female infanticide is, and neonaticide, meaning the killing of newborns, and the subject of Marianne Warren's 1985 book, Gendercide, that is sex-selective abortion, are some of the institutions that have been explored in terms of structural violence against women. I've done what I consider a kind of plausibility probe to see whether this framing can be extended to the subject of maternal mortality. I was stunned early in my research on gender and violence to find out that five to 600,000 women around the world were dying every year in pregnancy and in childbirth, and these are some of the most grotesque deaths that you can imagine. Um, why? Is it because they're in poor societies? Well, most of them are in poor societies. But there's also poor societies, Cuba, Bangladesh, in the Cuban case, that have succeeded in reducing maternal mortality to below United States levels, a much, much richer country. Now we start to see elements, then, of choice and intent. If you are a regime and it is your preference to spend your hundreds of millions of dollars not on maternal health, 
or popular health for that matter, but on shiny military toys, which seems to be the preferred approach. Just reading yesterday that Sudan's national budget now goes 75% to the military. That is an intentional decision. You have the resources available. Cuba, Bangladesh have shown you that you can um, bring about massive reductions in maternal mortality with rather limited investment of resources, but you don't. It doesn't mean that you, your motive is to kill women. Your motive is actually to get nice shiny military toys and feel macho and big and, and maybe bash the head of your enemy. But that choice represents an intentional deprivation of the resources necessary to sustain life among a huge portion of the population. And that death toll of five or 600,000 per year, which fortunately has declined somewhat since, is equivalent to the lower end estimates for the death toll in the Rwandan genocide in 1994, repeated every year. So why would we ignore that if our concern is about the intentional targeting for physical destruction of human beings. What are we missing when we miss the institutional level? Um, women's maternal, de uh, sorry, women's nutritional deficit, I think is one of the most often neglected ones. What does it mean to systematically underfeed girl children? in the earliest stages of their life versus boy children? What are the health implications of that and the destructive connotations of those policies? Um, uh, honor killing, sati, rape, murder, I'll talk about. Um, we can talk also about a phrase that has become quite common in the literature in recent years, genocidal rape, um, which is in itself, I think, reflective of structural and institutional forms of sexual violence against women. Does it indeed qualify as a genocidal strategy? It has been accepted as such by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And particularly when we understand, think of the Nanjing massacre in 1937-38, that the mass rape and gang rape of women is very standardly followed by their killing or is the means of killing them. Um, clearly there is a strong link to genocide. What does this mean in the age of HIV AIDS, where you can rape a woman and 20 years later, she may be uh, destroyed by the act that you've inflicted. So we're beginning to see some attention to this sort of structural dimension. Can we also consider structural and institutional forms of violence against men and boys. I've argued that we can, and I've, I've proposed here that certain forms of military conscription, which is after all a form of enslavement, um, when it comes to the kind of human wave assaults that are just throwing away hundreds of thousands of lives in kind of futile um, battlefield trench warfare. We really are getting the kind of sacrifice of an entire generation of young men in some of these countries. The picture at the top there is from the Ethiopia-Eritrea war of the late 1990s. The death penalty throughout history overwhelmingly targeted against males. Uh, in the United States, I think 98, 99% of those executed since the onset of capital punishment have been men. Vigilante killings and lynchings, I've done some exploration of this in the context of gender politics in the US uh, South and elsewhere during um, the Jim Crow period. But above all, and I think arguably, the most destructive human institution of all time, more than war, more than genocide, or at least one of the um, most destructive forms of genocide, the phenomenon of corvée or forced labor. Um, and you might sort of think of this in terms of building the pyramids. You might think of it in terms of the Congo rubber terror uh, or the Stalinist gulag camps. Uh, both of which swept up millions of respectively Congolese and Soviet males and resulted in dramatic demographic disparities between the sexes after 
the uh, period of the mass atrocities had concluded. Um, interestingly, there is a convention on uh, uh, forced labor, 1930, International Convention on Forced Labor. Bans forced labor, right? Nope. It allows forced labor for one group and one group only, men between the ages of 18 and 45 years old. And that is still international law. Okay? And why did that happen? Because many states refused to sign the convention if it inhibited their ability to conscript men for military duty. That is obviously a form of forced labor, and it was seen as essential to the security of the state. And so the same exemption for battle age men is enshrined in international law in a rather clearly um, uh, gendered and arguably gendercidal fashion. Um, one of the aspects of gender and violence that is just beginning to creep into the scholarly literature now is rape and sexual violence against men and boys. We've had very little sense of how widespread this has been in war and genocide going back thousands of years. The ritual castration, for example, of outgroup males, the, the, the bearing of their severed genitals as kind of trophies of conquest. Um, and if one looks, for example, at the experiences of those detainees in Syria today, you see standardly as part of the detention and incarceration and torture process, extensive sexual violence, um, rape including with inanimate objects is one of the most typical ways of breaking down, just as with the rape of women and girls, breaking down bonds of community, setting up all manner of uh, um, difficulty and tension and anxiety between members of the communities, humiliating populations, which is so much part of genocidal projects. You have to show to yourself that the person you're targeting is somehow subhuman and therefore you have to humiliate and persecute them into the kind of subhuman state that retrospectively justifies you imposing your genocidal designs upon them. As I say, we're just beginning to explore this and to realize how widespread it's been. But for example, I think there's some pretty indicative data to suggest that the systematic rape and sexual violence against Bosnian Muslim men during the Yugoslav wars was at least as widespread and perhaps more extensive than the systematic rape of Bosnian Muslim females. In Maine, because over 95% of those who were detained in these prison and torture facilities by the Serbs and other parties were male, a typical sort of male phenomenon. I don't have enough time to talk about the LGBTI dimension of this, but I've done some work, including on the subject of rape and genocidal rape, that shows above all how threatening these dissident gender identities and dissident sexualities can be seen in patriarchal society. And it is notable, and I do not wish in any way to discount the level of um, discrimination that is experienced by lesbians, but it is the case that in, for example, uh, the most systematic campaign, genocidal campaign against homosexuals that we've witnessed, which is uh, under the Nazis, it was exclusively gay men who were targeted. There, was, there were no legal or um, uh, discriminatory measures enacted against German lesbian women. That was considered irrelevant as far as the Nazis were concerned. As long as they did their duty, quote unquote, to reproduce the race, and the understanding was, of course, that they would be the pliant objects of men's designs, whether they were gay or straight, uh, that was okay. But the gay male under Nazism was an extremely threatening subject because he, uh, that male was not doing his duty to reproduce the race. He was a traitor to the purity of the folk. He was an effeminate undermining of the proud sort of Nazi uh, macho militarist tradition. And 
as a result, you saw persecutory violence. I think we see this also in what we might call the proto-genocidal violence that is afflicted on LGBTI communities, particularly against gay men and trans. And in both of those cases, you see groups that are seen as having violated patriarchal strictures in especially offensive or dangerous ways, uh, are threatening to the mostly male power holders in the society, and are therefore seen as specific um, targets for the kind of public brutality, often public brutality and violence that you see. Um, look also at the campaign going on in Uganda today against um, uh, homosexuals, and you will see that it is exclusively focused upon Ugandan men. Let's look briefly at the dimension of perpetration of genocide, because I've presented to you so far, at least in the men and masculinities concept, a kind of victim and survivor focused perspective, in large part because I think that's simply been absent from the picture before. We have a kind of stereotypical understanding of men as um, bearers of power and wielders of uh, discriminatory and uh, persecutory instruments. But that stereotype obviously is grounded in a pretty obvious empirical reality uh, that the overwhelming majority of genocidal perpetrators throughout history have been male and still are around the world today, well in excess of 95%. Um, why? Is that, nature ver is that nature or nurture or a combination of the two? There's one debate one can have around, are men physiologically, hormonally, biologically, um, predisposed to aggression and violence in a way that uh, chromosomal physiological women are not? I think it's an open question. Um, to what extent do these patterns of perpetration, including the specific targeting of outgroup men, reflect patterns of intramale hierarchy, competition, and conflict? I think that can be usefully studied. I think we get a lot of really interesting insights into the way that gender is being constructed for genocidal purposes by looking at some of the propaganda that has been, um, has been um, uh, used to accompany it. These kind of images often are meant to activate subconscious biases, subconscious anxieties and aversions within us. And they're also meant to marginalize and invalidate some, the outgroup, and to valorize and heroicize others, the in-group. And this will standardly be done in gendered ways, I would argue because Gender identities are among the most kind of intimate and organic that we feel. They can't really be taken off and put on as easily as many others. It's a particularly effective way to activate people's um, anxieties and concerns. Here's a couple of images that I've always found really interesting from the Nazi propaganda World War II. Okay, there's the Nazi male, but there's also the Nazi female, the German female. The male, the classic, erect, hard, impervious. Sigmund Freud would have a field day with that bayonet sticking up from roughly the midsection um, of the figure on the left, facing outward against all threats. Threats to what? On the right. The woman is designated as the bearer, as the symbol of home and hearth and domesticity, everything which must be protected about the folk, everything about the fatherland and the motherland that must be protected. And I've often argued that one of the best reasons to adopt an inclusive gender framing of these issues is because it allows us to realize these kind of relational aspects. Different messages will be sold uh, to women and men, depending upon uh, the gender identity of both the regime and its target audience. I think also, 
When we talk about relationality in the context of genocidal experience, feminism taught us to ask a question, where are the women? Revolutionary question. Um, if we also ask, where are the men? We often gain insights into dynamics that might otherwise elude us. And just a very quick example of that. There's been a lot of attention in the humanitarian literature to the particular plight of women as widows. Okay? This is a very widespread phenomenon, and as you can be as you can speculate, I'm sure, when a woman loses that sort of patriarchal connection with a breadwinner, she is often considered kind of chaff in the society. Um, widows were particularly vulnerable to being targeted as witches during the European witch hunts and still are in many witch hunting societies today. They're seen as objects of suspicion, something not quite right about them, okay? Well, that's really important, and I do reading and work on widowhood as well. Why are they widows? What happened? I think if you think about that for a second, you can see that there's a whole category of victimization on, to speak in binary terms, the other side of the gender coin that is implicit in that construction, but which is not really brought out. What has happened to the men that has produced this phenomenon of widowhood? Likewise, if you want to make uh, a point about raising concerns, let's say, f about mass detentions of the males of a community, which is a very typical pattern in mass atrocity, what are the implications on the other side of the gender coin? What happens to women who are left alone after males have been detained? What happens to their life chances? What particular challenges do they face? This kind of relational and inclusive understanding, I think, helps us forge some of those connections and also to develop new conceptual tools and tools of humanitarian intervention. I mentioned gendered propaganda, and there's two examples again from the Nazis. The classic Der, der Ewige Jude, the um, uh, Jewish, uh, the uh, Nazi exhibition, anti Semitic exhibition that toured in the late 1930s, that was the propaganda uh, poster for it. Fascinating image. Um, I have reviewed a very wide range of Nazi propaganda imagery around Jews, and I can count almost on the fingers of one finger the number of images of Jewish women that I've seen in Nazi propaganda. Virtually the totality of them depict the Jewish enemy as male, and they depict him as shifty, corrupt, physically gross, disheveled, dirty, that's activating a lot of sort of health and hygiene anxieties that may be kind of subconscious, um, subversive. One of the things that I've tried to do with that list of terms uh, above the images is to show how many of our standard terms of uh, defamation and abuse are actually deeply gendered. And unfortunately, I think we can all kind of play this game if you actually think to yourself, okay, imagine a demon, imagine a monster, um, imagine a terrorist, imagine a rebel, imagine a spy, imagine a subversive. What's the face that comes to your mind? Is it female or male, traditionally? I'm arguing that there's a lot of implicit gendered um, uh, implications in this language that's being deployed, and we need to understand the connection between the use of this kind of rhetoric and phenomena like the mass roundups of outgroup males viewed as being terrorists, subversives, dissidents, rebels, etc. Um, on the right, actually, that's a, uh, uh, an image from the uh, Nazi propaganda in the Ukraine showing the classic Judeo-Bolshevik. So here it's a stereotypically Jewish figure, but now wearing the Bolshevik cap with the red star. We see the kind of combination of the political and ethno-religious dimension. I think we see the gender dimension writ very large. We probably also see an image 
a, a, an aspect of social class there. It looks like a kind of vagabondish figure, doesn't it? Kind of dirty, lumpen looking figure. Uh, again, that combination of variables, including gender, but here really limited to the depiction of gendered males. You can find examples of, the gen of genocidal propaganda, as I would define it, against females. You'll notice, first of all, that the words, the rhetoric I'm citing here, are far fewer than in the case of men. And I've, you, maybe you can think of one or two more that I've forgotten. But I think this reflects simply uh, that under patriarchal society, women's roles have tended to be much more circumscribed than men's and have tended to be domesticated in the sense that it is women's reproductive capacity above all that has been emphasized. Likewise, a lot of the genocidal propaganda directed against women tends to emphasize either their reproductive capacity uh, such as, oh, their baby factories, you have to kill the women so that they won't give birth to the next generation of terrorists, right? That's, again, a military logic there to a certain extent. Um, or their sexuality. And when you see the um, image at the top there, that's from a woodcut from the medieval at the era of the uh, early modern uh, European witch hunts, you see the construction of the crone, the, implicitly the widow, in league with the supernatural, a sense that women's uh, gender and sexuality naturally orients them towards supernatural connections or involvements. This clearly is reflecting a lot of misogynistic um, fantasies about womanhood. And in the bottom there, from the Rwandan genocide, the targeting of Tutsi women as being a kind of sexual elite in the society and of being a particular subversive threat, a kind of fifth column that was able to seduce the fine upstanding Hutu males. And you see very clearly in the Rwandan genocide, incidentally, not only a great deal of humiliating violence and sexual violence directed against Tutsi women to cut them down to size, but it's one of the main strategies that is used to sell the genocide to Hutu women in Rwanda. It's like, you've always been told you were less beautiful than Tutsi women. Now you have your chance to take your revenge and to humiliate them and make them dirty and to make them far below anything that you are. And the Rwandan genocide, notably, is uh, the case where we have, I think, on the historical record, the highest amount of direct female participation among genocidal perpetrators. Probably not more than 10 or 15 percent among uh, uh, direct perpetrators, but that's nonetheless uh, many times more than the norm. I'll conclude with some thoughts on where we go with this and how some of these insights may assist us in developing more nuanced and effective tools of humanitarian intervention in genocide and mass atrocity. And let's again keep with this rather boring binary for the moment of women and girls on one side and boys and men on the other. But addressing, I think, first the particular gendered needs of girls and women. Um, there's been very interesting research done recently about how the so-called new or degenerate wars, of which wars in places like um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is probably the classic example being the most destructive military conflict in human terms since the Second World War, six or seven million people now directly killed as a result of that, but relatively few of them killed by munitions the large majority killed by um, structural forms of uh, violence, such as starvation, disease, the breakdown of infrastructure, the breakdown of medical services, the disruption of agricultural cycles that is standard in these kind of new wars where civilians are the targets. We know that women are especially vulnerable to sexual violence in these conflicts, that rape becomes seen as basically one of the standard uh, lures 
to draw young men in particular as perpetrators. So the way that warfare is shifting now, arguably, to become more genocidal in itself, to focus on the destruction of civilian populations, is probably stripping from women some of the limited exemptions that they may have received from exterminatory violence in previous models of warfare. Um, Attention to rape and sexual assault, including genocidal rape, I think it's fair to say this is now at the forefront of the international humanitarian agenda. I've argued that we need much greater attention to gendercidal institutions, to structural and institutional forms of violence against women, because that is likely to be the principal form by which mass mortality among females is engineered intentionally in, um, as it has been for millennia, it's likely to continue to be. And if it's true, as I've argued, that there is this tendency to disproportionately or selectively target the males of a community for killing, as with the phenomenon of widowhood or the woman who is left alone while a male is incarcerated, there are very specific and significant humanitarian needs and policies that need to be addressed to women in that particular gendered situation. With regard to boys and men, I think we need to move past our stereotypes that they are uh, never more than the kind of bearers and inflictors of violence and to recognize um, and incidentally, it's often men that often have the hardest time recognizing this because it means acknowledging masculine vulnerability. It actually, I've been struck by the fact that ever since I began this inquiry, the majority of people who've been interested in it and have supported me in various ways have been women, usually self-identified feminists. And I think that maybe has something to do with this reluctance among many men to sort of conceive of themselves as potential victims and survivors of violence rather than the more macho model. We need, I think, greater attention to the background dynamics of state repression, the way that, for example, mass roundups and detentions of men that are not in and of themselves genocidal, but maybe the canary in the coal mine that shows us that something worse is on the horizon. We need to understand the way that the targeting of that sector is often a prelude to root and branch forms of genocide and gives us a, a point of possible intervention there. And I also think that some understanding of structural and institutional forms of violence and gendered vulnerability are relevant in the case of men and masculinities also. Um, in summary, I'm arguing that a gender-inclusive approach to the subject of gender, a humane and empathetic and advocacy-oriented approach that does not arbitrarily exclude any uh, gendered category of the population from consideration or from empathy and concern is most appropriate to the project of atrocity prevention and genocide prevention that we're engaged in. So we have a few moments for questions and comments, and I'd also like to remind you uh, to fill out the evaluation survey, uh, which all of you should have. If you don't, uh, please let me know and I'll get, make sure that you get one. And um, when we uh, break, we'll leave them at the back, okay? But please, go right ahead. Uh, under the topic of uh, genocide directed against gay men, mm. uh, you didn't mention uh, during the Reagan era uh, when AIDS, um, even before it was called mm. AIDS, uh, manifested itself uh, first uh, with gay men. So the government years uh, before they allocated funds and um, interest. Uh, maybe, uh, the kind of effort that I believe they were capable of doing. Yes. Yes. I agree, that's a very good point and probably does reflect indeed some of the mindsets, probably also some of the kind of female and feminist-centered advocacy around health issues that was already 
rather well established when the HIV uh, crisis took hold, um, perhaps the absence of such advocacy, the absence of such kind of thinking, specific thinking about health needs of males was a factor indeed in that kind of stereotypical. There was also, as I recall from that period, a lot of emphasis on homosexual promiscuity. These people brought it on themselves because they're going out and having sex with hundreds of men. There was a kind of masculine, a gay masculine uh, stereotype constructed that, that suggested they had lost control on some level. They'd lost the type of rectitude and masculine control that was ideal and therefore were, um, deserved what they got. Maybe in general, we're more inclined to say that men deserve what they get as opposed to women. You know, that's a pretty a dangerous kind of assertion these days to make that a woman is asking for it, whatever it is. We're perhaps less I've often had comments, for example, that, well, what do you expect? Sure, men are gonna be killed. You know, they're, they're the ones doing the fighting. This conflation of the victim with the perpetrator is very easy to do in the case of men because they're all part of the same gender class. Boys will be boys, right? So I think that's very interesting. I'd also just like to mention that in terms of contemporary examples of this, I mentioned the Ugandan case, but in terms of actually genocidal atrocities, murderous atrocities, where this is most evident right now is probably Iraq. And that was true even before Islamic State took hold. The kind of systematic campaigns by uh, officials of the Shia regime, Shia-dominated regime in Iraq, against um, gay males in particular were savage. And we're seeing it, of course, also with Islamic State, that um, uh, IS considers any homosexual man basically to be a traitor to Islam. Their, their typical punishment is to be thrown off a tall building. You may have seen uh, examples of this, but they will be executed for it. I, I think there is no place in the world right now where the discrimination against uh, LGBTI broadly, because this includes trans as well, is so pronounced and so close to being uh, genocidal as I understand the concept. Thank you for the comment. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, as far as uh, AIDS goes, back then and to the present, rel the religious right attributes AIDS as God's vengeance against sin. Indeed. And on the day of 9-11, one of the, uh, I don't remember which one of them said that 9-11 was because of homosexuality yeah. in the United States. Yeah. And there's somebody who's backing Ted Cruz. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think what we're seeing there, I mean, I've been using the term patriarchal ideology as a kind of catch-all, but given that most societies have been heavily religious, it's always had a religious spiritual dimension and justification. The hierarchy between men and women is justified because God determined it to be so, and the designation of what is acceptable sexuality versus unacceptable is also considered to be God-given and so on. So I, I would say that patriarchal um, formations and institutions reflect a wide range of influences in which we, which we see writ very large in the religious texts and precepts of the society in question, often. I probably more the monotheistic religions than others, interestingly. Yeah. yeah. Go right ahead. Okay. No, I, I just had a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that generally, in terms of the LGBTQ community, that it is, is men who are targeted, gay men. Uh, to the, I would say gay men and trans women okay. are probably the two most vulnerable groups under the surface, and maybe also trans men, you know? I, I'm not sure we've seen much data on that. So are there case studies in which it's actually women, lesbians, who have been targeted? And if not, is it, is it literally because it doesn't, I mean, as you said, it doesn't matter because doesn't as long, as, long the as they are, you know, also fulfilling whatever. Right. To my knowledge, there has not been the kind of exterminatory policies directed against that category. Obviously, substantial discrimination, humiliation, um, abuse, violent 
actions, uh, killings, selective, but systematic, society-wide, large-scale campaigns. I'm not aware of one, so I would say, and I would be grateful if you make me aware of it if I'm not uh, clear on that. Go ahead. Um, I just had a question. When you defined gender at the beginning of your talk, you sort of said that, or this is my understanding correctly, um, that it's a, you say it's both physiological and cultural, that this is a combination. And I was interested in how the perpetrators would define gender, if gender is even on their radar, or if they're more interested in the physical. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it sort of it sort of reflects the way that we use gender instrumentally. You know, people talk about the gender gap in politics. Okay, how do you measure it in the United States? Like the supposed propensity, for example, of women to vote Democrat and men to vote Republican. We call it a gender gap, but we mark it by counting sex bodies of women on one side, sex bodies of men on the other. We have no, we don't say, okay, you know, you are um, a, a somewhat, uh, you know, you're, you're, we don't get into sort of questions of masculinity and femininity and whether a given individual reflects more one or the other. We just go, frankly, on the basis of secondary sexual characteristics, right? So um, to a certain extent, I think, uh, Genocidal perpetrators pretty much operate on the same basis. They're, these are very rarely neatly surgical operations, right? Genocide, almost by its nature, by, by definition, has a mass character. And the kind of designations that are applied are often very careless and, and often very loose, and they're often very superficial. Uh, Tutsi Hutu in 1994 is another example of that. Um, so my sense is that there is no, I have never seen anything like sophisticated thinking about gender and sexuality among genocidal perpetrators. Generally, they tend to reflect the most um, simplistic and usually politically reactionary understandings of gender and then to apply it in a very kind of uh, broad brush and brutal fashion, you know? Well, I think there's a pretty good literature around war, genocide, and other upheavals of that type that shows that they tend to promote or coerce women into non-traditional gender roles, particularly uh, uh, if they find themselves as heads of household, breadwinners, which is generally kind of masculine constructed category. And you can view that to some extent, some do in terms of new roles and opportunities for women, or you can view it from uh, the perspective of kind of necessary desperate response to uh, difficult situations. You don't want to think that all of these women are saying, oh good, my husband's dead, now I can be independent, obviously, right? Um, I, think, I think this is quite interesting to see in the context of race relations in the United States as well. And the volume that I put up on the screen, Gender Side and Genocide, includes a chapter by my colleague Augusta Del Zotto on black male gender side in the United States. And she's taking very much the kind of structural and institutional analysis, looking at the ways that um, ideological and institutional formations have produced the extremely high levels of mortality among young black men in particular. Uh, the kind of uh, anomic behavior that often leads to, we could say, self-destruction if we didn't see the kind of forces that are behind it. And um, I think it's a, a kind of framing that is worth applying. The anthropologist Nancy Shepper Hughes has a phrase that I use a lot in my writing. Uh, she has an essay called The Genocidal Continuum. And I think it reflects something of what I'm trying to get at with this um, uh, relationship to 
uh, structural and institutional forms of violence. She's saying, look around us at our own societies and see the kind of patterns of marginalization, discrimination, persecution, exclusion, incarceration, deprivation of liberty, um, mockery, humiliation, you know, these kind of tropes, and see that they are part of a continuum. She's not saying that they are all genocidal in and of themselves, or that they are all genocide in and of themselves, but they have a kind of proto-genocidal component. They are the kinds of ideologies of in-group, out-group, worthy, unworthy, that when mapped onto mass killing enterprises produce genocidal outcomes, but in fact are all around us in our daily lives. She looks at the phenomenon of homelessness in this society, which is also a very gendered phenomenon, incidentally, and our ability to not see the vagabond on the street and to not grant, usually him, sometimes her, a full measure of humanity. They're a, they're, they've kind of been reduced to the status of an object, uh, a kind of distasteful adornment, uh, a violation of the expected order and dignity of the public space. And when you start getting into that kind of thinking about human beings, you're quite far along a genocidal continuum. It doesn't take much for people to say, what are we seeing in the American presidential campaign now? You know, immigrants are trash and therefore, or legal immigrants anyway, undocumented, therefore, what are the proposals? I mean, the, the mildest ones right now seem to be a form of ethnic cleansing and mass expulsion. And that's being seriously discussed. The mass expulsion of 11 million people from this country is being presented as a pivotal part of the uh, political platform of currently the most popular contender for the Republican nomination. I find that sort of stuff scary, and I think it's important not to think of something, it's one of the reasons I emphasize the logic of genocide also, not to think of genocide as something that always happens safely out there, over there, done by people who aren't like me at all, because I'm so nice, right? Um, we need to understand that it is very deeply embedded in human psyches, in human societies, and that very similar patterns of marginalization and exclusion can not only be part of a genocidal continuum, but if they take the form of structural and institutional violence, as I described, can in fact be more destructive in that form than traditional genocides. Thank you. Yes. lack of concern, you know, yeah. it wasn't, I mean, to a certain extent, I remember reading, Pauline Kael wrote a, re a movie review of The Godfather and was talking about the gender politics in The Godfather. She described this as, this kind of mafiosi society, as a society in which women are not even important enough to kill. And there's a certain element of that, curiously and paradoxically, that the depiction of women as being irrelevant can grant them a certain measure of protection if, as a perpetrator, your primary concern is with those whom you do consider relevant in the sense of being able to pose a threat to you, right? Um, but a, to a, lot, a large extent, a lot of the exemptions that may be granted to females in that context are granted in a kind of paternalistic and infantilizing fashion. Uh, kind of the patriarchal bargain, right? You get that measure of protection, but in return, we keep you safely away from the realm of full citizenship and full rights. Um, it's one of the sort of paradoxical implications of that, I would say, and uh, to a lot of, uh, uh, correspondingly, a lot of the violence that is directed against men, particularly by others who are also men, has to do with the power relationships of the elite gender class within the society and the intramale dynamics of that. Um, a, ma a man who is uh, above others in the hierarchy or seeks to be will tend to view that competition in patriarchal society as one with other men in which women are 
secondary to the matter if they're even considered. And I think that does help us to understand some of the kind of intra-male, intra-masculine dimensions of these killing campaigns. Hi. Um, so with regard to female infanticide, you know? An interesting case because we also tend to assume that genocide is committed by the state, right? Not that it's organized at the grassroots. But here, female infanticide, the reason you have such a high death toll is because you have millions of individual households making independent decisions to murder the girl child. You don't have a state campaign to go into houses and collect up all the girl children and kill them. It is the result of institutionalized patterns of discrimination and thinking that are embedded at the very grassroots of the society and are fairly constant over time. I mean, you could say that in times of great economic stress or deprivation, for example, girl children perhaps are more likely to be murdered than at other times because of the economic dimension to it. But you certainly wouldn't see a kind of event-style eruption of it, I would suspect. And even if there was, it would only be an, a small component of the overall death toll, I would suggest. So that would be one example. And I think even when you talk at the level of indigenous peoples in North America, um, there are certainly eruptions in the United States context related to, let's say, the Plains Wars of the latter half of the 19th century. There are times when um, direct physical killing is more prominent than at other times. But when direct physical killing isn't there, what's happening? You're still having the constant uprooting of populations, trails of tears, death marches, populations being consigned to barren reservations where they can't sustain life. And that's actually how the large majority died. And they died over a protracted period of centuries of those policies being instituted. So we're drawn to, you know, Little Bighorn and Custer or Wounded Knee as being kind of somewhat symbolic representations of that genocide. But I don't think anybody studying the experience of indigenous peoples anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, anyway, would suggest that really the majority of the killing and, and destruction is being carried out by those in those sort of narrow event-based contexts. It's much more general policies that over time become structural, become institutionalized, and they generate those elements. Thank you. Yes, I was. Uh I mean, you mentioned a bit about the indirect factors of genocide, and that we're mentioning also affects females. I was wondering if you have any more about economic sanctions, um, mm. which unfortunately we continue to believe that it's a mm. sufficient tool, but yes. economic sanctions often in yes. exercise as well. I, I, think, I think that's a, a great example. Um, I have done work on sanctions, particularly in the case of those imposed on Iraq in the 1990s. In chapter one of my textbook, I call them genocidal sanctions because of the massive death toll they inflicted. And given that so much of that death toll was related to the collapse of health infrastructure, you would have to assume that in areas like maternal health in particular, there would have been a dramatic impact on you know, levels of maternal mortality. Um, I'm not familiar with a really good gender reading of those sanctions regimes. Have you come across anything? Well, I'm from Iraq, so okay. I'm actually very interested in that topic. And what, and through my experience, I noticed not just uh, throughout the economic sanctions, but after that, I um, 
through work, I got to see all the housewares of where the medicines were stored. And the medicine expiration is often by 2001, 2002, yeah. which is way before the war. Yeah. Um, while hundreds of children died annually in Iraq. So it really directly affects uh, children and women because in that period of time, men were selected or often even forced to remain in the country. Where they would have at least be fed. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, that sounds to me, it sounds to me like an area that needs some really nuanced research. I'd love to read more about that. And um, of course, one can talk about the Saddam Hussein regime and its own gendercidal policies against, look at the Anfal campaign against the Kurds in the late 1980s. It was quite a classic. There was root and branch killing, but most of the component sub-campaigns of Anfal were very classical, almost Islamic State style campaigns of separating uh, adult men from the remainder of the community, trucking the men off to be killed and buried in mass graves. And then you set up, I visited actually a couple of these Kurdistani camps in Iraq, uh, where um, overwhelmingly children and women are kind of left to fester in really dire humanitarian conditions. So uh, his method of war waging was actually very typically gendercidal. The consequences of it in terms of the sanctions regime imposed on the general population may well have had a discriminatory gender impact against um, women in particular. I hesitate to use this phrase women and children incidentally. I don't like it very much. Whenever I hear it, I think what I hear is women are children. You're kind of creating a naturalized, essential relationship and you're also doing something a little bit Many people are doing something a little bit sneaky where they're kind of drawing boy children into a broadly feminized category in order to generally ger generate big numbers. Like 75% of refugees in the world are women and children. <gasps> That's a gender issue, right? Break it down. 50% of refugees in the world are female. 50% are men. How is that possible? Because the children category includes male children as well as female children. Typically, in countries in the global south, children under 18 are 50% or more of the population. And so when you add all of the under 18s to adult women, you get 75%. If you add all of the under 18s to adult men, you also get 75%. But we don't hear the phrase men and children, do we? And I think that's actually an interesting and somewhat manipulative rhetoric and a very, a phrase that kind of rolls off our tongue in a way that I think we need to interrogate a little bit more. Feminists have done that, I think, to show how it kind of does infantilize women by linking them to children. But I don't think they've uh, sometimes quite got to grips with the way that that's sometimes used to generate these inflated statistics and to make something into a gender issue a specifically gendered issue where um, an inclusive framing might actually be much called for. I've done some writing on that, but I can recommend it. Thank you. All right, well, please join me in thanking Adam Jones for his wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. I just want to acknowledge our visitors up here in the front row. Some of them have already left, but this is um, a wonderful group of young students and staff from Queens College, the Center for Ethnic, Racial, and Religious Understanding. Who, are, um, who have come all this way uh, to join in and to be a part of this discussion. And I hope it's the thank beginning of, of, of a, uh, many future chances to collaborate and work together. So thank you all. Great. Yeah.